Hello, good morning, everyone. We're so happy you could join us today. We're here as part of the Age-Friendly Health Systems 4N training for healthcare practitioners. And we are, are here for the third part of four. And as we get started, Emma, I, I would like to ask everyone to please mute themselves on, unless uh, you're speaking or we get to the Q&A session to make it easier for everyone here. We're so happy to have you here today in part three of four. And today we're focusing on mentation and medication of the four M's. This, uh, this series is being hosted by Urban Health Partnerships in partnership with the South Florida Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. Um, and we are here today to talk about this age-friendly health system model. And hopefully by the end of this, series, you'll be able to know more about the model, communicate the age-friendly health systems model, and identify your role, scope, and opportunities to practice the four M's in the healthcare settings. And as I mentioned, we're in part three of four. So our first session focused on a, a great introduction to age-friendly health systems and why they're so important, especially with our changing population and uh, aging population. Our second module last week focused on two of the M's, what matters most and mobility. And today we are focusing on the other two, which are medication and mentation. And today I'm happy to share uh, with you that we have two wonderful speakers, uh, Dr. Raymond Ownby and Dr. Todd James, who will be speaking on these topics. And now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Raymond Ombi. He is a professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine at Nova Southeastern University, where he is also a professor in the Public Health and Biomedical Informatics programs. Previously director of the Memory Disorder Clinic in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Miami, he has a long-standing interest in developing effective strategies to enable older persons to age successfully. He has published more than 200 research articles and has been the recipient of several research grants from the National Institute of Health that focused on using technology to enable old, older persons to age successfully. His current research includes studies of cognitive training and transcranial electrical stimulation to maintain and improve cognition and functional status in older persons and the elderly. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Onbi. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me get the slides up. Uh, and, and thanks very much for the opportunity to talk about this topic today. I think it's terribly important. Um, and uh, as probably everyone here who's a clinician already knows, uh, concern about cognitive decline and the development of, a, of dementia is, is a, very prominent in older persons. Uh, uh, excuse me, it's not working. Here, let me get it there. Yeah, <laughs> it's very prominent in older persons' uh, thoughts. I have a couple disclosures. Um, do have uh, grant, uh, recent grant support from the National Institute on Aging, as well as the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. And I own stock in a company called Enelon Communications, which focuses on developing uh, digital health interventions. Here are the learning objectives I'd like uh, to be able to achieve today after this uh, presentation, you should be able to list sources of evidence that cognitive decline in aging may be prevented, uh, list three modifiable lifestyle factors related to better brain health, and uh, state two strategies for encouraging uh, behavior change in patients or clients. So I'll start out, uh, why brain health, and then move to can dementia be prevented, further discussion about modifiable lifestyle factors, and then I'll make some recommendations for, I think, uh, strategies that may be helpful to patients. So first off, why, why do we even talk about brain health? Well, this uh, admittedly rather busy figure on the left is a representation of an article from Jeffrey Cummings a couple of years ago. I don't think the situation has changed much, where he tried to track down every single clinical trial uh, focused on uh, either uh, preventing dementia or treating it. And as you can see, there are a lot of uh, treatments going on, but you may notice there hasn't been 
uh, very many, uh, haven't been very many uh, drugs available for the treatment of either cognitive decline, uh, mild cognitive impairment, as you know, perhaps uh, often considered a uh, prodrome of Alzheimer's disease, or in fact, any treatments, disease modifying treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And most of them have focused on, or many of them have focused rather on the substance in the brain called amyloid, a protein. We think that something goes awry in processing amyloid. Uh, it can uh, gloms up in the brain, kills off nerve cells. This we know. Uh, it's not quite clear exactly how all that happens, but many attempts have been made to find treatments based on this amyloid cascade hypothesis, as it's called. And now, <clears throat> until just last week, I would have been able to say, by the way, there hasn't been a new drug approved for Alzheimer's disease since 2003. Uh, some of you who follow the news will, will know that something was approved, a drug called aducanumab was approved um, on what some people believe uh, is weak evidence. So you may have, if you follow again the news, you may see that the FDA has uh, uh, generated some controversy with this approval. Uh, that landmark Alzheimer's drug confounds uh, research community that was in nature this past week. And uh, even several of the advisors on the FDA advisory panel uh, have uh, uh, resigned over this. So I think uh, the existence of this newly approved drug doesn't uh, eliminate the need for us to search for better ways to prevent cognitive decline. And, and that line of thinking, the, the ability perhaps to prevent or at least slow down cognitive decline in the elderly has been uh, very active in the last few years. In 2017, the National Academy of Sciences uh, appointed a blue ribbon panel to look at the problem. And they said there are really three things that we could focus on that would help prevent cognitive decline in older adults and the elderly. And those are control hypertension, uh, regular exercise, physical activity, and then do computer-based cognitive training. Um, then even just this past fall, this headline appeared in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, which said uh, as many as half of dementia cases could be prevented or delayed by addressing these 12 risk factors. I'm not going to read all of them. Uh, the uh, Lancet Commission report is uh, freely available online. You probably find it very simply if you uh, Google Lancet Commission 2020. Uh, but that's led some people to conclude that brain maintenance may be the primary factor in successful cognitive aging. And I mean by that, avoiding decline and even Alzheimer's disease. Genes and lifestyle are key. Yes, of course, genes are important. We know that some genes are, are risk factors for the development of Alzheimer's disease, for example. We can't do too much about genes right now, but we can help people change their lifestyle. And it, it is, we believe, that some interventions, lifestyle interventions, can promote brain structure and function with increasing age. So you might say, well, what interventions? Well, the one that you really can take to the bank uh, is exercise. There have been uh, many, many, many studies that have shown positive impact of exercise on uh, cognition in older adults and the elderly. This is a meta-analysis of a number of studies from several years ago, but the situation hasn't changed, uh, that it's very clear, even uh, mild exercise of the sort of walking uh, 20 or 30 minutes, two or three times a week can have a positive impact on cognition. And we know that that may not be too surprising. This study, for example, showed that exercise actually increased the size of the hippocampus, the hippocampus being a portion of the brain that is first and early affected in Alzheimer's disease and also critical for new memories. Uh, and so what we, we see in this study is over a period of a year, there's the hippocampus in section on an MRI, uh, people's uh, hippocampi actually got bigger. Uh, really uh, something, a striking finding. And that's in contrast to the other parts of the brain illustrated there that uh, show no increase in size. Another thing, uh, another area, another modifiable lifestyle is diet. It's been shown multiple times in a number of studies uh, that uh, the Mediterranean diet 
is uh, associated with a reduced risk for developing dementing illnesses. There's a, the food pyramid on the right. Some of you are familiar with it. Again, if you want to know more about Mediterranean diet, there is an enormous amount of uh, uh, information online. And I think the last time I was in Barnes and Noble, there was a, a whole section of uh, diet and uh, recipe books do don uh, <laughs> donated, devoted to uh, the Mediterranean diet. And here's a, another meta-analysis, this one uh, looking at adherence to the Mediterranean diet and risk of developing cognitive disorder. And what that box on the bottom shows is that overall, given a number of studies, pr prospective studies, uh, that higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet is associated with a reduced risk for developing uh, Alzheimer's disease. Another uh, risk factor that has emerged in the last uh, several years, uh, perhaps in part because of some mechanistic, very interesting mechanistic studies, is the impact of sleep on uh, the risk for Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. Poor sleep has been linked to increased dementia risk. Then it was shown that slow wave sleep, that stage, deep sleep uh, stage of uh, sleep, it, when that's disrupted, it actually increases cerebral, cerebrospinal fluid amyloid beta uh, levels. So that people have uh, positive that developing and improving uh, people's uh, slow wave sleep may be a promising intervention for Alzheimer's. And this is what I referred to. It's a fascinating article that showed during slow wave sleep in humans, the flow of cerebral spinal fluid actually reverses. That is, rather than simply leaching out of the brain, it goes back in, back and forth in time with the slow waves. And why that's so uh, important is it's, it sounds as though what may be happening is that the cerebrospinal fluid is actually working to remove amyloid during this period of slow wave sleep. Uh, I mentioned cognitive training. Uh, as Ferris Bueller said a long time ago, life moves pretty fast. And that's one of the essences of what seems to be effective cognitive training in uh, dementia prevention and preventing cognitive decline more generally. Um, perhaps the uh, best known and certainly the one of the biggest and more rigorous studies of cognitive training was something called the ACTIVE trial, that advanced cognitive training. Uh, had six sites, 2,800 participants. It was sponsored by the National Institute on Aging. And in it, there were four, uh, tr uh, four treatment groups. One group uh, got memory training. One got reasoning training. One did speed of processing training, doing a computer-based activity that uh, sped up their ability to think. And then there was a control group. They did just 10 sessions over six weeks. The intervention for speed of processing, by the way, was something called useful field of view, which is still used in cognitive training studies and is actually commercially available. <clears throat> and this is what they showed. Uh, up there at the right is the legend. The blue line is the speed of processing group. Well, as you might expect, People learn to do things faster, that's good. That's the just pre-test, post-test difference. Uh, but then even three years later, they were still doing pretty well. That little blip is probably because some people got uh, booster training sessions between year two and three. And then at year 10, what we see is uh, that people 10 years later still perform better on the psychomotor speed task than they did at baseline. Uh, a really striking effect size. Um, so you could say, I think very reasonably, so what? So what if you can do better on some test uh, 10 years later? Uh, might be interesting, it's a fascinating finding, but what does it really mean for us? Well, these folks have been followed now long enough. The study started in 1996, so that people have been followed long enough to look at their risk for developing dementia. And this is what we found. Uh, 331 participants developed dementia. The people in control, 14%. People who did 10 or fewer cognitive training sessions, 12%. And if you did more than uh, 10 sessions, 11 to 14, the risk was 8.2%. So it looks like that the speed training was associated with lower risk for dementia by 8% per session. And that 
uh, HR down there at the bottom stands for hazard ratio. That's suggesting that the, doing that kind of cognitive training uh, reduced the risk for developing all, uh, dementia by almost half. Well, what about combining treatments? That's been an active area of interest uh, in the last uh, probably five or six years because we have a lot of single treatments that seem to uh, have some kind of impact. Um, Here's one I, I select because this, was, this involves people with MCI. And again, MCI stands for mild cognitive impairment. That's a condition where people have clear evidence of problems with memory or some other cognitive functioning, but they're still not demented. They're still able to take care of themselves, for example. And what this study did was look at combining physical and cognitive training in people with this MCI. And what it shows is that the combination of treatment was associated with increased regional cerebral blood flow around that area of the, hip, the hippocampus, that area that we know is critical uh, in uh, formation of new memories and early implicated in Alzheimer's pathology. In, in a, this is a post hoc analysis, but I thought it's fascinating. Uh, there's several uh, studies of this multi-component, that is doing things like cognitive training, diet, exercise, some uh, combination of things, including blood pressure control. There were two studies uh, discussed in this article. One was uh, had an acronym of FINGER. Uh, there they looked at the uh, impact of the intervention on people with and without uh, APOE4, a known genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And what we see there is that it looks as though the people who had APOE4, placing them at higher risk of developing uh, demanding conditions, seem to have a stronger response to the multi-component lifestyle. Then the other uh, study on the right, uh, they actually did PET scans for amyloid. So they knew people, some people had more amyloid than others. And there, what they found, again, very suggestive, was that the response of people, the cognitive response of people to the um, uh, multi-component uh, lifestyle intervention was actually statistically significantly more robust than those people without amyloid. Very suggestive that this may actually be a robust approach to uh, reducing people's uh, likelihood of developing cognitive problems. <clears throat> and from a clinical point of view, you can say, again, so what? People do better on cognitive tests but in this uh, meta-analysis, the folks found that there was actually uh, reason to believe that uh, people did a little bit better, not an enormous treatment effect size, I admit, but that the people did significantly better uh, in terms of their activities of daily living after multi-component interventions. So we're gonna put it all together, what would you say? Well, I think this would be my recommendation for a target for somebody's brain health training program. Daily or near daily, people should do exercise, aerobic exercise, uh, mentally stimulating activities, things like reading crossword puzzles. That's, I'm making that uh, distinction there between that and cognitive training. Uh, Meditation seems to be very beneficial for older adults in, in a number of ways, including um, improving cognitive function, the Mediterranean diet, and then working on people's sleep. And then I would say for weekly, uh, at least some formal cognitive training, at least two to three times a week, and then strength training several times a week, perhaps including balance training. As we know, both strength and balance training can reduce the likelihood of fall. So it's an important part of any uh, approach to uh, geriatric health, I think, but uh, may actually help with both brain, brain health and reducing the risk of uh, falls. So I mentioned that one of the biggest problems I think for healthcare practitioners is even when we know that people should do things, it's tough to get them to do it. Uh, it's so much easier to write a prescription for a pill than say encourage people uh, to actually enact a brain health plan. But one uh, strategy that I think is particularly useful in the area of health behavior change is something called motivational interviewing in that when you talk to a patient, you express empathy, empathy, you develop the discrepancy. And what that means is 
you, you say something like, well, I understand that you really want to exercise several times a week, but you just haven't been able to get around to doing it. You acknowledge resistance to change there. You say, yeah, you know, changing your life is hard. And then you support people's self-efficacy, certainly reinforcing their efforts to change. Another strategy that's been shown to be useful in uh, making behavioral health change is to facilitate uh, SMART goal setting. Uh, the SMART is an acronym for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Time Specific. What it means is, you know, encourage people to make uh, uh, goals, and I encourage uh, people to actually write them down because it's been shown writing them down makes a difference in how likely they are to use it. But specific, so not get back into shape or, or eat better, but something like walk 20 minutes three times this week and, or diet eat uh, two servings of fruit or vegetables at least three days this week. So they have to be specific and measurable and they have to be achievable. You know, we don't encourage people who are uh, not physically active to go out and train for a marathon, unless maybe they wanna do that, but uh, at least start with something small so people can experience success. And of course, uh, the goal should be relevant to the person. It has to be something they think is worth doing. If not, it's, uh, it's just never gonna happen. And then time specific, don't say, I'm gonna get uh, in shape someday. Say, I'm going to lose weight and exercise regularly starting this week and continuing over the next several months. So the bottom line on this, uh, dementia prevention, I believe is possible through promoting brain health. And the, there's really strong evidence, I think of that. Uh, specific types of cognitive training, exercise, and diet may slow cognitive aging and reduce dementia incidence. A brain health plan should be part of a comprehensive uh, strategy for senior health, I think. I do want to take just a mi minute to mention that we're doing a brain health study where we're comparing two approaches to encouraging people to do, um, make, uh, develop rather, a brain health plan and enact it. If anybody's interested in it, uh, the uh, inclusion criteria, anybody 50 or older who's interested in brain health would like to know more about developing a brain health program. And as long as they have a computer, a tablet with internet connection and an email address, because we're doing it all online, in part because of COVID and in part because of difficulties for a lot of people with transportation. The intervention involves a, a baseline assessment. It's a 12-week study. Uh, there are weekly video conferences that include a didactic on various brain health topics, as well as goal setting and goal planning. Uh, cognitive assessment and, uh, is done before and after that people can get feedback about their cognitive functioning, and we give them free access to a commercial cognitive training site for the duration of the study. Participants are also compensated, and what we're doing, as I said, is comparing treatment as usual with an intensive uh, effort at behavior change. So if anyone's interested, they can contact uh, the nurse practitioner who works with me, Rosemary uh, Davenport, or you're welcome to contact me, Ray Ombi. Uh, there's my email address. That is absolutely the best way to get in touch with me because we're still only in the office a couple days a week. I don't always get phone messages as regularly as I should. Uh, my email is ro 71 very, very simple at nova.edu. If you're interested in more in brain health, we have a study website set up. It's sfbrainhealth.com. That's just SF like South Florida, brain health, all run together.com. So uh, that's uh, the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ondi. We are going to hold the questions oh, till okay. the end of the the session just so we have time for both presentations but I know that there's going to be some great questions and conversation and if you don't want to forget your question you can already post it on the chat there and I'll keep an eye out for that and we'll we'll get to those after our second presentation so now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Todd James he is an associate professor of medicine and clinic and a clinician educator in the division of geriatrics at the University of California San Francisco he received his medical degree from the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine and went on to complete internal medicine and geriatric fellowship training also at the University of Illinois. Dr. James is a board certified in geriatric medicine and internal medicine. He provides inpatient care at UCSF Medical Center at the Acute Care for Elders Program and the Geriatrics Orthopedic Co-Management Program. 
He is a geriatrician leader for the UCSF Age-Friendly Emergency Department Program. Dr. James teaches medical students, residents, and fellows about geriatric symptoms and principles of geriatric care, including functional assessment, prognosis, care coordination, and goals of care. He has created curricula for health professionals, which address complex patient situations and interprofessional team care. He is a co-chair of the Interprofessional Special Interest Group at the American Geriatric Society and serves on the Communications Committee of the American Interprofessional Healthcare Health Collaborative. Thank you so much, Dr. James, for being here, and I will hand over uh, the presentation to you. Thank you so much, Isabel. I'm, I'm really glad to be here today. Let me pull up a, my slides here. And let's see, does that show up okay? Yes. Great, okay. Um, my background, I, I think you probably see the Golden Gate Bridge and I am here in the San Francisco um, Bay Area. It's supposed to be very warm out here. I don't know if you heard about that, but uh, in San Francisco itself, the high is gonna be 76, but for us, that's just as hot as someone who is getting 111 degrees in Sacramento because uh, we're just not used to the 70s here. Um, I'm really uh, glad to be with you today. I'm gonna talk about um, age-friendly care, especially about medications. As for disclosures, I don't have any uh, disclosures right now. Um, I want to uh, tell you a little bit more. Isabel mentioned that I work um, at UCSF Hospital and I work in our geriatrics consult services. So I see patients regularly and uh, we have uh, an acute care for elders unit where that's a special unit where we have a team approach. And then we also see consults across the hospital. We are implementing an age-friendly emergency department. And so there's a lot that we're trying to do there to provide a modified geriatric assessment for older adults who come to the emergency department. Part of that includes medications. I had been uh, in Indiana University and I've also worked in house calls. So you may have seen this diagram and I'm sure it's come up multiple times about uh, the four M's, <clears throat> what matters, uh, mobility, medication, and mentation. And my goal today will be to shine a light on how an age-friendly focus on medications leads to better and more appropriate care. We want patients to receive appropriate and helpful medications. Many medications are extremely useful and effective. Uh, we want patients, caregivers, and the healthcare team to identify the best medications that make sense uh, for uh, looking out for the other four M's. So we don't want medications to inf interfere with what matters for patients, their mentation, or their mobility. Uh, this is a short talk today, and I'll only address a few important points. Uh, when medications are necessary, we want to use them in a patient-friendly uh, way. Uh, so much of our health system is laser-focused on very specific problems and treatments and it can be very easy to lose sight of what matters, medications, mobility, and mentation for each individual. For instance, just last week, I became aware of an older woman uh, who, maintained, who was maintained on a, a detrol, basically, in the hospital. This is an anticholinergic. It's often used to manage stress and urge incontinence. But in the hospital, she was always close to a commode and a bathroom and if she needed to make urine, that should have been very easy. But she was maintained on her detrol anticholinergic. But because of the influence of other drugs, her opiate pain medications, her being post-surgery, she began to retain urine uh, when they checked with a bladder scan. And then she required straight catheterization. You may have seen this happen in your training or in the, where you work. Um, she was then started on bethanicol in an attempt to promote her making urine, but no one ever reviewed her medications to remove essentially the offending medication that was contributing to this problem. So this is uh, an example of uh, medication cascade, which we'll talk about a little bit more, 
one drug leading to the next drug in an attempt to treat symptoms rather than dealing with root causes. And um, we'll come to more of that. Let's look at uh, some objectives for our talk today. Uh, we'd like to describe resources for identifying potentially inappropriate medications. Uh, we'll illustrate the risk in specific clinical scenarios. Uh, we'll describe evidence that alters management for common practices and we'll uh, formulate improved care plans uh, engaging interprofessional resources. Our goal is certainly appropriate medications. Medications can cure disease, prevent disease progression, improve symptoms, and improve functioning. Um, balancing safety and quality of prescribing with appropriate treatment of all comorbidities is complex and challenging. Uh, geriatrician input, internist input, pharmacist review can certainly improve drug appropriateness in older adults. However, sometimes we're trying to solve problems with medications that medications cannot fix, uh, like sleeping at the wrong time uh, or behaviors related to dementia. Uh, in another example, let me tell you about the story of the church lady. Uh, she was a woman I saw at a hospital earlier in my training. She was trying to solve a problem with medications. She fell at church and then she was brought to the emergency department and was found to be confused and she was admitted. I went with the geriatrics fellow to evaluate her and on examining her, we found a medication patch on her abdomen. This was the next day and she was a lot clearer thinking. She said, oh yes, this is my pee patch. She told us her church service is very long and she really didn't wanna lose her urine when she went to church. So she always wore nine patches on Sundays and then she saved them from other days to wear them on Sundays. So this is an anticholinergic drug, Detrol, and it's known to cause uh, confusion in older adults. And this woman essentially overdosed uh, in an attempt to create a situation where uh, she could be at church in a way that was working for her. So she was trying to solve a problem, but um, it turned out that if, if people had inquired, or perhaps if she'd had a medication review, it, it might have come up how she was using this medication. Additionally, none of us remains the same. We change, our needs change, and our physiology changes as we grow older. Drug absorption, drug distribution, metabolism, and elimination change with aging. Some of these changes are usual physiology of aging, and sometimes um, with chronic conditions, other things uh, cause problems with medications. And then as drugs that we take uh, multiply, um, the interactions of these drugs increase and it, the actual uh, ways they increase are, are probably uh, not fully understood even um, by science. Um, if we have eight medications we're taking regularly, how are they interacting is not entirely clear. So possibly the medications we take should change as we grow older, but they're not always changing at the rate they should. And sometimes we get inappropriate medications. The question might be how to identify potentially inappropriate medications. And there are a couple systems of how people have worked through this. Um, one system that is rather prominent is the AGS Beers criteria after Dr. Beers. Uh, there's also a screening tool for older people's prescriptions called the STOP tool. The European Union has uh, also come up with a list of potentially inappropriate medications. And this also comes up on the Choosing Wisely program, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. This is just a clip of the Beers criteria. They were originally conceived in 1991, so not that many years ago. Uh, Mark Beers was a geriatrician and he, he noticed that some medications were causing his patients more trouble than other medications. Uh, the Beers criteria catalogs medications that cause side effects in older adults, especially due to the physiology of aging. 
The list has been reviewed and upgraded multiple times since 1991. The most recent review is the 2019. It's a tool with which I'm most familiar. It's a guideline only, and it's the hope is to find medications where the risks are outweighing the benefits. Um, the criteria are not meant to be applied in a punitive manner. So sometimes it's been said, oh, if it's on the beers list, it's forbidden, and the patient shouldn't get that medication. And that, that isn't the case. Uh, we have to use common sense. Uh, some medications that can cause side effects are still very worthwhile um, when uh, they are just the right drug for the right problem. So prescribing and managing disease needs to be very individualized. You may have heard of the STOP criteria. They're similar, um, but uh, slightly differently organized. Uh, in one study using STOP, uh, the assumption that was that potentially inappropriate prescribing is highly prevalent in patients who present to the hospital. So they applied the STOP criteria to a cohort of hospitalized patients, and they identified at least one potentially inappropriate medication in 35% of the patients who were admitted in this particular hospital. I believe that their uh, the total number that they looked at was around 800 patients. Uh, they summarized that well-recognized adverse event, effects of inappropriately prescribed medications were either causal or contributory to the hospital admission in 11.5% of those they screened with the STOP criteria. So 35% had a potentially inappropriate medication, and by reviewing the record, they felt that that medication or a combination of medications caused a problem that led to the hospitalization 11.5% of the time. Uh, they concluded in that study that the STOP criteria were sensitive in identifying patients uh, who could be subject to potentially difficult situations. So the Institute for Healthcare Improvement is the promoter of the 4Ms movement or the age-friendly hospitals and health system movement. And in their materials, they list some potentially inappropriate medications when they talk about the medication M. And uh, I see these potentially inappropriate medications every day of the week, and you might as well. They're very common, and the reasons for using these medications are not unusual. The list is there in orange, and I'll give some examples as we go down the list. Benzodiazepines like alprazolam or lor lorazepam, opioids uh, like oxycodone, uh, anticholinergics like Benadryl, and for instance, uh, Tylenol PM contains Benadryl, um, sleep medications of all kinds, Ambien, Zolpidem, muscle relaxants like Baclofen, tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, and antipsychotics like quetiapine. Every time I see these medications and the work that I'm doing, I'm, I'm triggered to review them and ask, are they helping? Are they doing what they're supposed to do? Are they causing side effects? The ABIM, uh, which is the uh, a board um, provides board certification in multiple internal medicine specialties, asked what might be wiser. Um, it's certainly been known that there are many practices in medicine that we do sometimes for no reason, um, and we don't always have good evidence, and sometimes uh, we should be changing our practices. Dr. Ownby mentioned how hard it is to change, um, and it doesn't matter uh, who we are, uh, if we're trained a certain way, it's, it might be hard to change and we have to make some efforts to do so. So the Choosing Wisely program of uh, specialty societies were asked to identify practices that providers should question. And they asked that care should be supported by evidence, should be free from harm, and be care that is necessary. So I'll, let's look at what the American Geriatric Society said. 
they submitted 10 practices and we'll be able to touch on three of them today and they had to do with medications uh, medication cascade specifically antipsychotics and benzodiazepines first let's start with a patient story and we'll talk about d prescribe e so she fills her own medication pill boxes she takes 18 pills a day and uh, she's actually someone who likes to take her pills and um, has been proud of that but her daughter's been noticing that there are errors in the pill box and there's always a danger when there's a lot of medications is medication cascade medications are added sometimes to treat side effect symptoms of other medications and this can really increase the risk of receiving incorrect medications, having adverse drug reactions, and uh, having non-adherence. Most common adverse drug reactions that we see in vulnerable older adults um, are cognitive impairment, falls, functional decline, and delirium, I would add to this. Um, for instance, um, an example, we had a patient just recently in our age-friendly emergency department, about 70 years old, who was prescribed Ambien for sleep. Well, we learned that, um, but the patient was complaining of memory problems, but they were recent memory problems only over the last three months or so. But it was just at that time that the patient got a prescription for Ambien for sleep. And so there's, it's possible that the Ambien is a, creating side effects that the patient perceives as difficulties with memory. It's, this is a setup for a medication cascade. I've seen many patients um, get denepazil, let's say, because someone wants to give them something for their memory. And denepazil also can have side effects. And um, this is just an example. 40% uh, of older adults take more than five prescriptions. And this is more than 20 years ago. And if we add over the counter medications, 20% uh, of older adults are getting more than 10 um, agents. And that's really not surprising. And it might even be higher now um, based on what I see. One way to deal with medication cascade um, is to, to have a medication review, but the health system has many obstacles for, for folks to do medication reviews. And one of the biggest ones is time, uh, time limitations. And patients uh, don't always bring a medication list. They don't always bring their bottles with them. Um, you may have experienced those things. I had a patient that never brought his medications and I actually never really knew in primary care what he was taking because he would say, just look at the computer. But as we all know, that's, that's actually insufficient. There are many people who could uh, conduct medication reviews, nurses, pharmacists, therapists, but we really need um, ways to handle that. In addition, the, con the context of the medication review matters. What are the goals of care for the individual? What's their life expectancy? Uh, what's the time to benefit? Um, what's the burden of therapy? Um, what are their values? What are their quality of, of life attributes that they want to protect. Um, prior prioritizing these factors begins to set parameters for optimal uh, medication profiles. And as the older one gets potentially, uh, the more important the context of the medication review matters. We, we aren't just asking about medications, it's about how they're fitting into the life of the individuals that we're seeing. Uh, so we could remember the story of the church lady, for instance, because we learned that going to church was really important for her. And so that would be something we'd want to support and find safe ways for her to do. There are tools to assess preferences uh, that patients have. Um, and this is one, you may not be able to see the detail of it, which is okay. Um, but the individuals asked to rank those items that are in the banners um, between zero and 100. This was done originally on an iPad, I think, and people were able to move those banners around to where it was important for them. The banners uh, asked them to value maintaining independence, keeping you alive, 
reducing or eliminating symptoms like dizziness, fatigue, or shortness of breath, reducing or eliminating pain. Um, and if we order and rank those things, um, and it might be, be an easier way to figure out um, the context for a medication review. Um, patient priorities care, you may have heard of this, um, that's something that's easy to look up online. It's a whole program for addressing the context of care, especially for older adults. Um, patient priorities care is a real program. It requires a substantial interview, which is really usually done by someone other than the physician or the nurse practitioner or the physician assistant. Um, such a program like patient priorities care has to have buy-in uh, by the medical system to fit into their processes and procedures. This topic of medications is really worldwide right now. Um, sometimes it goes by the name of de-prescribing. And I'm just showing this uh, website, Deprescribing Canada, um, to give an example. And these websites sometimes give strategies uh, for medication review. Here at UCSF, researchers are leading efforts to learn more about deprescribing, or another way to say that is aligning medications with patient priorities, and it's definitely a work in progress. I have another quick example about why this is important. I have a friend, Maureen, in Grand Rapids, and she cared for her mother, who was on the diuretic furosemide, or Lasix, at 40 milligrams a day. And that's very common. Maybe many of the patients you see have that. Um, but her mother was started on dialysis over a year before, but she'd stopped, and she stopped making urine entirely, but she was still taking furosemide. And Maureen was looking for some off-the-cuff advice about what they should do, um, and they were struggling to get back to that clinician whose name was on the bottle to see if they should keep taking it. Uh, Maureen's mother desperately needed a medication review. Others are interested in this. The Lown Institute um, has a focus and, and provides supports uh, for uh, change. Uh, this is just some items from their website, um, noting that medication overload um, might be low value care and might definitely affect uh, patient safety issues. So uh, to bring a, a full circuit for uh, D prescribe B, uh, she visits primary care with her daughter. Uh, her daughter is concerned and brings a large brown bag of all the bottles that she can find. Um, they discuss uh, goals and what's important for D prescribe B at the time to benefit and her values, what's important to her and they decide to prioritize the vascular medications and that and D prescribe B um, agrees to only work from the medication list um, and essentially to stop going to GNC for supplements. And in the trial, um, they're gonna reduce the um, number of pills to seven pills per day. And the primary care office is gonna see her monthly until they achieve a plan that's agreeable to, to D. I'm gonna very briefly just talk about uh, what the um, Choosing Wisely program and the American Geriatric Society had to say about antipsychotics and about benzodiazepines. I wanna be uh, careful about our time to give everyone an opportunity to ask questions. So one of the Choosing Wisely campaign items was about antipsychotics Possibly you see these used, Haldol, Olanzapine, Ketiapine, uh, in those with dementia. Uh, Dr. Ownby, probably you see these from time to time. So the American Geriatric Society's advice was not to use antipsychotics as a first choice to treat behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. Um, since uh, dementia represents a chronic uh, degenerative process of the brain, it probably isn't surprising that behaviors are affected. I think I will focus uh, uh, just briefly on this story um, because it illustrates the points and, and it is based on uh, real cases. I had an 89 year old man with moderately advanced dementia. He lived at home. He was a handful for his wife, Mary. Uh, she had to watch him 24 um, seven. He disassembled furniture. <laughs> um, he was very active. He tries to leave the house, he's aggressive. And uh, Mary's friend's husband got daily Haldol um, in that particular situation. And the previous provider for this patient, Andy, had given them lorazepam. 
which may not be uh, the wisest choice. Um, antipsychotics are often prescribed, but there there is no known significant benefit of antipsychotics other than sedation. And so we really need alternatives. What what might work? Um, Andy's at baseline. Uh, we need more history. Uh, we need to know what other drugs he might be taking that are either on his official list or not, because some of them might have anticholinergics. And it does seem in this case that it's behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia that we're dealing with specifically. Uh, those are many, um, repetitive questioning, refusing care, awake at night, aggressiveness. There are uh, solutions, and I'm just going very quickly on this. Um, there are behavioral uh, type solutions about changing the environment and having flexibility. Uh, people have spoken to this. Um, DICE is a mnemonic, and it's also a program um, that is provides a systematic way for people to address behaviors. And actually, there's even a book for this as well, uh, Dr. Helen Kales. So just to resolve the situation very quickly, I. Um, they, by having uh, the talk with a family and understanding more about what was going on, um, they found that he liked to disassemble Legos and he didn't seem to mind that people were putting the Legos back together again. Uh, so that gave him an energetic activity. Um, as far as leaving the house, he was trying to go to work is what we found out and uh, putting a sign on the door that the um, subway was broken and in repair uh, was all he needed. It was on the inside of his front door. He read the sign and came back in and said, I can't go to work today. So small things can very much make a big difference. Uh, for benzodiazepines, uh, the American Geriatric Society said not to use benzodiazepines or other sedative hypnotics like Zolpidem um, as a first choice for insomnia, agitation, or delirium. And indeed, uh, what is required is a fuller understanding of the situation, and there are many ways uh, to address this. Um, I'm going to jump ahead here. I had a lot of slides. Um, there's a lot of known difficulties, especially with the benzodiazepines, for causing many adverse events, especially in older adults. And while they certainly have a good effectiveness for some things, uh, uh, for sleep, especially um, other things like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is now available um, in an app uh, can be very useful. So we've looked at uh, some practices we should question. Uh, we looked at care supported by evidence that's free from harm, care that's beneficial. Medication review is really very important and paying attention to potentially inappropriate medications and getting familiar with what those are and beginning to ask questions can be very, very useful. So I'll come to a close there. Thank you so much, Dr. James. I know there's there's a lot more that can be discussed. We really appreciate everything you were able to share today. And now I want to open it up for questions. Um, I did see one already come in from Karen, and this one was for Dr. Ownby. Um, she wanted to know what are the requirements for the study that you mentioned? Oh, I, I answered that offline with a direct oh, message. Basically, 50 years and older, interested and have email and an internet connection. But people are welcome to uh, contact me directly if they have any questions. I'll stick my email address in the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I actually um, had a, a question for you, Dr. James. If you could share just a little bit about the Age Friendly Emergency Department. Uh, I, it's a, it's definitely has overlapped here, but it's it's a little bit different than the, the model that we're talking about specifically. Could you share uh, some of the work that you're doing with that initiative? Uh, yes, um, we're responding to uh, the American College of Emergency Physician uh, program, which has a certification program. There's level one, two, and three. And that's provided an impetus for many emergency departments to make a change and to begin to modify their work for vulnerable older adults. And in our case, um, we are doing, we have a special um, provider, it's a, a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner, and we call them a Jedi. And we like that uh, Star Wars analogy, um, Jedi standing for uh, Geriatric Emergency Department Implementer. And they are uh, doing screening, screening for um, elder abuse, screening for medications, screening for cognitive impairment, depression, delirium, 
and we are also um, screening for caregiver uh, um, issues, um, caregiver stress specifically. Uh, this is meant as an ancillary activity. It's a, it's a parallel pathway in the emergency department. It is not meant to uh, slow them down in the emergency department, but to take advantage of all those gaps and waiting times. Um, and then our challenge now is to link that to the entire healthcare system as we get results or positive screens. How do we share that with primary care um, and other agencies in the health system? We've already found many things, uh, even though we've just gotten started a couple months ago. Wow, that's really interesting. And it seems like it would be, you know, useful for anybody working in a, in a hospital, not only the emergency department as well. Um, I have a question for both of you. Um, as physicians, could you speak a little bit to, to the importance of working as a healthcare team? So the role of nurses and, and other people in the healthcare system to address mentation and medication? I, we can start with Dr. Ownby and then go to you, Dr. James. Yeah, sure. Well, that's, I think that's a, a great question. And of course, it's uh, uh, unfortunate sometimes that uh, the role of nurses, the incredibly important role of nurses in geriatric care, it isn't always as appreciated as it should be, since nurses often really know what's going on with a patient, a level physicians don't. Uh, yeah, and I think nurses have a great role in things like medication reconciliation, uh, patient education about medications and uh, very basic things about um, finding out about patient adherence that again, uh, many clinicians don't always have enough time. Uh, physicians have enough time to find out. Yes, thanks Dr. Ownby. Um, we, we're finding that uh, most of the initial care plan items for the geriatric syndromes that we identify are nursing. Um, nursing-led, nursing-driven, um, we need all of our health professionals um, for good care for older adults, and especially, and um, we uh, value them. Uh, we have an interprofessional education and practice program here at UCSF, and the principles of that program and the trainings are very relevant to the work that we're doing, uh, because we really need... Uh, everything that uh, health professionals can offer. So many health professionals have a, a terminal degree of doctorate now, and the amount of training that people receive is really interesting and surprising. So for instance, and it may vary. So some pharmacists are very skilled at interviewing and um, motivational interviewing like Dr. Ownby had identified. And uh, we have, uh, we, we don't know until we ask. And so we really are um, seeking to understand and utilize people to the full degree of their abilities. We don't want to limit people. That's wonderful. Yes, I. It, it definitely sounds like every, there's a role for every healthcare provider, every, every person on the healthcare team, and each person will bring a unique perspective that can assist in, in achieving this age-friendly health system. Well, I think we are out of time. I mean, thank you again, both Dr. Ownby and Dr. James for your presentations today and sharing your experience and knowledge. I know there's so much more that we could talk about and this is hopefully just the beginning of um, a, a, a journey towards age-friendly health systems for all the people on this uh, training. I want to ask all of you to please help us by completing an evaluation. We put the link in the chat as well. You can also hold up your phone um, photo app to these, this QR code and it will open the link automatically. Um, and this, this will ask you, you know, if you learned anything today and about the training, and it's really helpful to us for our future planning and, um, and knowledge for for, for developing opportunities. And lastly, um, I wanna thank you again for your time. I, I think I skipped a slide. I want to, in, to invite you to participate in our last session that's taking place next Thursday. And it's going to be really focusing on putting it together. So what are some considerations we should have if we want to go through this age-friendly health systems journey? What are some resources that are available to us here in Florida and here in South Florida through the GWEP uh, department. So I'm really looking to, uh, 
forward to that. And if you missed any of the other sessions, we have recorded all of them and we will be sending links out to all of those. I know some people have reached out, so you will get a link to that. And we are, we would love for you to share it with your colleagues and other staff in your uh, departments. Thank you again for your time today. And we look forward to seeing you next week. And I'll leave you all with this contact information. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Likewise.